So a pleasant day, dear doctors, and welcome to our examination rationalization session for infectious diseases. This is Doc Toon. Pleasant day to everyone. Now, before we go with our rationalization, I just want to remind everyone of Bloom's taxonomy of cognitive domain, wherein there are several tiers of thinking skills and learning, which begins with remembering, understanding, application, analysis, evaluation, and creation. Please take note that the recent PLE boards, majority of the questions focuses on higher order thinking skills, which is creation, evaluation, and analysis. Less emphasis is placed on pure recall and remembering. So with this in mind, I want everyone to remember that this is where our syllabus is now shifting towards so that you will be prepared for your licensure examinations. So let's begin. This is the first question. The stage of pneumonia characterized by consolidated exudates within alveolar spaces, which is characterized by enzymatic digestion and plural fibrinous reaction leading to organization and thickening. So step number one, dissect the stem of the question. What is being asked here is stages and the disease is particularly pneumonia. Please remember that there are several features here of a specific stage which is being characterized. Number one is enzymatic digestion. Number two is plural fibrinous reaction. And we have organization and thickening. So what stage of pneumonia is this? Is this congestion? Is this red hepatization? Is this gray hepatization? Or is this resolution? So is this congestion, red hepatization, gray hepatization, or resolution? So always remember in congestion, this is increase in the inflammatory cells, particularly the neutrophils. Clinically, this is where the patient would present with RALS on auscultation. Red hepatization, because the lungs appears congested, erythematous, and it appears like the liver. Gray hepatization would be the opposite. Now, let's dig deeper. The first stage of pneumonia is congestion. There is a characteristic red vascular engorgement. There are polymorphonuclears and numerous bacteria. So your keyword for congestion, your buzzword here is vascular engorgement. And as mentioned earlier, this is when clinically the patient can present with rals, they can present with crackles. So here, there's the presence of a few neutrophils, there's dilated capillaries because of vascular engorgement. The second stage is red hepatization. This is characterized by RBC congestion, and there are now more polymorphonuclears. This is when the lungs appears to be liver-like. Okay, the consistency is liver-like, hence the term hepatization. The lungs appears red, it is airless, and it is firm. So this is the second stage of pneumonia. So as you can see, 
there's an increase in neutrophils, the capillaries will be congested, and there is now extravasation of the red blood cells responsible for the red appearance of the lungs. In the third stage of pneumonia, there is gray hepatization. This is when there is now disintegration of the RBCs. However, there's going to be persistence of exudates and the lungs now appears dry and grayish. Hence the term gray hepatization. Now for the fourth stage of pneumonia, this is when there are now consolidations. There is now consolidated exudates. There's the presence of enzymatic digestion. And this reaction, which occurs in the pleura, a pleural fibrinous reaction, this leads to organization and thickening within the lung parenchyma. And this is a picture of that consolidation here. This is a classic low bar pneumonia. So going back to that question, stage of pneumonia characterized by consolidated exudates within alveolar spaces and enzymatic digestion. Correct answer is D, resolution. Now the second question is primary pulmonary TB frequently involves this region of the lungs. So take note, this is primary pulmonary TB and not a reactivated or secondary TB. They are asking the specific region of the lungs. Is it middle, lower lobe, middle and lower lung zones, or the upper lobe? Correct answer is middle and the lower lung zones. Why? If this is the lungs, please remember, Primary pulmonary TB, which is usually seen in children, the aerated areas of the lungs is in the middle, going to the lower lung lobes. However, in adults, the highly oxygenated area is now the apex of the lungs. That is why we see secondary TB in the apex of the lungs because mycobacterium tuberculosis is an obligate aerobe. It loves oxygen. So just please take time to review this recording so that you can master it depending on your own personal study pace and how much you want to master things. Now, next question. A 25-year-old African-American came to your class came to your clinic with a biopsy result revealing a starry sky appearance of a lymph node. What virus is most likely associated with this condition? So go back to the salient features of the stem. You have a 25-year-old, which is generally young, specifically an African-American. They are now revealing the biopsy results of a lymph node which has the starry sky appearance. So we are now going into pathognomonic buzzwords. Is this measles? Is this parvovirus? Is this Epstein-Barr? Or is this pox virus? Now, you would classically eliminate measles. Look at the age of the patient, 25 year old. Measles can present with a lymph adenopathy, but you do not biopsy that lymph adenopathy. It classically presents with fever and rash. Parvovirus B19 presents with a slap cheek appearance. So it presents with a different type of rash. It does not present with lymph adenopathy. And this is also a childhood disease. Pox virus, on the other hand, has been eradicated. Pox virus is going to be associated with molluscum contagiosum. It would not present with lymph adenopathy. 
So your correct answer here is Epstein-Barr virus. First, what is the disease? This is a two-step question. This is Burkitt's lymphoma. Okay, you have an African-American. You have an association of a lymphoma. And that is your starry sky appearance. So take note, Burkitt's lymphoma is an aggressive non-Hodgkin's B-cell lymphoma. This disease is associated with two viruses. One is Epstein-Barr virus. Second is HIV. And there are chromosomal translocations, which is associated with an overexpression of the oncogene C mice. So Burkitt's lymphoma is more common in the African Americans. If you see a lymph node biopsy of Burkitt's lymphoma, it has the starry sky appearance. Now this is the description of the starry sky pattern or the starry sky appearance. So here, let's label this A. That's how a starry sky pattern looks like. Let's say that's the Milky Way or the galaxy. And letter B here, this is the starry sky appearance or the sheets of lymph nodes or lymphocytes in Burkitt's lymphoma. So what you see are B lymphoblasts, okay? which are opposed, closely opposed to each other, forming a dark blue background. And that dark blue background is what we call the sky. Okay. That dark blue background is what we call or refer to as the sky. Hence the term starry sky appearance. Now, if there is a microscopic finding associated with these viruses. Measles virus is associated with the Warthin-Finkeldi cells. Okay, Warthin-Finkeldi cells. Pox virus, the inclusion body is going to be the Guarneri bodies. Now next, hand foot mouth disease. So you are now being given the diagnosis. Is characterized by vesicular rashes on the hands and the feet and ulcerations, which involves the mouth. Now this mainly involves children. Question, what is the etiologic agent? Is this staph areas? The answer is no. Staph areas, if it presents with a rash, this is associated with the toxin exfoliatine. And this is, of course, associated with Ritter's disease, which is the most severe form of staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome, or SSSS. Cornibacterium diphtheriae, mm, the answer is no. Why? This presents with the pseudo-membrane of the pharynx. Koksaki A or Koksaki B? So here, by testmanship, you know the answer is most likely going to be between A or B. Koksaki B is cardiotropic. This causes myocarditis. Therefore, the correct answer is Koksaki virus a, okay, hand, foot, mouth disease. Now, this is your guru guide. Two conditions caused by Koksaki. A, that's herpangina and hand, foot, mouth disease. They both start with a letter H, and I want everyone to say, ah, look, ah, the sound, ah, because when you say the sound, ah, you open your mouth. And these are the lesions of herpangina 
And these are the ulcerations of hand foot mouth disease. For you to say, ah, that's koksaki ah, not koksaki ba. That is herpangina and hand foot mouth disease. Now next, 45 year old woman. So here's your keyword underwent renal transplantation as prophylaxis for CMV infection. What drug would you administer? So always remember it is stated in Harrison's that patients who undergo renal transplant, you should anticipate cytomegalovirus infection post-transplantation. So what is now the drug you would administer for CMV? So the rule of thumb is all herpes family, okay, which would include herpes simplex 1, herpes simplex 2, Epstein-Barr virus, and varicella. They are all treated with acyclovir, except CMV, which is treated with gancyclovir. Correct answer here is gancyclovir. Now, please remember, the drug of choice for cytomegalovirus is gancyclovir. The drug of choice for herpes simplex virus is acyclovir. So please make sure everyone gets that. Okay? Again, drug of choice for cytomegalovirus is gancyclovir. Drug of choice for herpes simplex infection is acyclovir. Now the next question, papilloma virus serotypes. So you're talking about human papilloma virus. This is associated with carcinoma of the cervix and the penis. So what serotype is it? Correct answer is serotype 16 and 18. HPV 16 and 18 are oncogenic and they are associated with cancer. Okay, particularly cervical, anal, and penile cancers. So HPV serotype 16 and 18, they are oncogenic and they are associated with cervical anal, and penile cancers. Now, a six-month-old presented with three days fever following dissipation. Take note of that word. It's kind of deep English. Dissipation of the fever. There was a blanching, evanescent, pink, macular, papillary xanthan that developed on the neck and trunk. What is the viral etiology of xanthan subitum? Classic student would think that you're going to be asked a diagnosis. What did the examiner do here? They gave you the complete description, history, physical exam, and they gave you the diagnosis. Sorry, but they popped your bubble. So what is now the etiology of exanthem subitum? Okay, this is caused by human herpes virus 6. This is also known as six disease. And that is exantem subitum or rosola infantum. So in rosola infantum, this is also known as exantem subitum. This is the classic description which is lifted from your textbook. Exactly what you saw lifted verbatim, converted into a case. Following dissipation or disappearance of the fever. So with fever defervescence, there's going to be a blanching, evanescent, pink maculopapular rash that develops on the neck and the trunk.
Now, the drug of choice for an HIV positive male who presented with progressive dyspnea, PO2 of 80%, and bilateral diffuse lung infiltrates on x ray. Correct answer is trimethoprim sulfa methoxazole. Please remember this is a case of pneumocystis gerovecci or pneumocystis carini pneumonia, PCP, keyword HIV. Here's dyspnea. There is O2 desaturation. So that is the hallmark of PCP, and that is hypoxemia. Diffused lung infiltrates would clinch the diagnosis. Prophylaxis and treatment, drug of choice, is trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. Just watch out for Steven Johnson syndrome. And this is should be used in caution in patients who have glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency or G6PD deficiency. So the most common cause of pneumonia in an HIV patient is pneumocystis carini, which is now known as pneumocystis cerovecci. The hallmark of pneumocystis carina pneumonia is hypoxemia and bilateral chest infiltrates. Hypoxemia and bilateral chest infiltrates. Drug of choice for treatment, as well as prophylaxis, is trimethoprim sulfa methoxazole. Now, what is the antifungal that is teratogenic and carcinogenic? Now, please remember, fluconazole is teratogenic. However, it is not carcinogenic. Therefore, it cannot be the answer because two things are asked in your stem. Teratogenic and carcinogenic. Capsofungine is not teratogenic and carcinogenic. Amphotericine is teratogenic but not carcinogenic. So the correct answer here is griseofulvin. Now, please remember, griseofulvin is classified as category C by the FDA. It is carcinogenic, embryotoxic, as well as teratogenic. This is associated with liver as well as thyroid cancer. There is something which you have to remember because this is highlighted in Harrison's. Prolonged use of this antifungal, voriconazole, is associated with the development of cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma of the skin. Again, griseofulvin is associated with liver and thyroid cancer. It is carcinogenic, it is embryotoxic, and it is teratogenic. The antifungal voriconazole, which was not in the choices, has been linked with subcutaneous, uh, with cutaneous rather, squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, this recording will be made public, so I'll give you the link right after. Now, the drug of choice for a patient presenting with hepatosplenomegaly, a lace-like pattern on ultrasound, and there is portal hypertension. So what is being asked here, the subject of your stem, is what is the drug of choice. Therefore, they're asking for the best drug. So what is this patient who presents with hepatosplenomegaly and a lace-like pattern on ultrasound plus portal hypertension? This is a classic case of intestinal schistosomiasis. The lace-like pattern is your giveaway, and the portal hypertension tells you there are already complications of portal hypertension aside from pre-sinusoidal obstruction. So is the drug of choice rifampicin? No. Is it mebindazole? 
No. Is it metronidazole? No. The correct answer is praziquantel. This is the drug of choice for all species of schistosomiasis. Now, a 35-year-old male, so that's your keyword, 35-year-old, diagnosed with HIV, routine checkup, CD4 count is less than 100. Now, that value should give you a warning sign. What possible opportunistic infections is he prone to? Is it tuberculosis? I saw spora belly, cryptococcal meningitis, or progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. Now, please remember, tuberculosis would be caused by MTB. As the CD4 count gets lower and lower, particularly less than 50, you will now be dealing with a mycobacterium avium intracellularic complex. Cryptococcal meningitis, this is caused by cryptococcus neoformans. Progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, this is caused by the JC virus. So what is the correct answer here? It is progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, what we commonly call PML. So here is a table which was discussed in your lectures, wherein magic number less than 200, you are now labeled as HIV. Certain opportunistic infections, particularly pneumocystis cerovecci, Next would be herpes simplex. Here's the isospora belly. Then when it's less than 100, there's toxoplasmosis. There's cryptococcus again. There's now cytomegalo. And here's the progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. Now, always remember the MAC, the mycobacterium avium intracellular complex, becomes most significant when the CD4 becomes less than 50. This is when you now give treatment as well as prophylaxis with azithromycin. But as the count reaches less than 100, you already give the azithromycin. Now, prions causing spongiform encephalopathies, including human disease. Correct answer here would be Crutzfeld-Jacob disease. AIDS dementia is not caused by a prion. Subacute sclerosing encephalopathy, this is caused by measles. Therefore, you only have two things to consider here, scrapie and Crutzfeld-Jacob. Most common prion disease that affects humans is Crutzfeld-Jacob. So this is associated with the Prion protein, PRP, rapidly progressive dementia. Then there's going to be startle myoclonus. So rapidly progressive dementia and startle myoclonus. Now, the viral etiology of hydrops vitalis and erythema infectiosum. Is it Coxsackie A, human herpes 6, Epstein-Barr, or parvovirus B19. So please take note, it's not Kotsaki A because this is herpangina as well as hand, foot, mouth disease. HHV6 is exanthem subitum. Epstein-Barr virus is Burkitt's lymphoma. Correct answer is parvovirus B19. Now, which of the following scenarios describes post-streptococcal GN? Which of the following scenarios describes post-streptococcal GN? So here... Look at the age alone. Post-streptococcal GN 
is the sequelae of a group A beta hemolytic strep. Okay, that's strep pyogenes. Either tonsillopharyngitis or a skin infection. 14-year-old with increased creatinine, hemoptysis, shortness of breath, no. 10-year-old with progressive bipedal edema in the past 60 days, no. 8-year-old female with a history of a skin infection before developing oliguria, hypertension, and anasarca, or a 12-year-old with history of upper respiratory tract infection. Now look at this. So the nephritogenic strain of group A beta hemolytic strep can either cause strep pharyngitis or strep skin infection, particularly in pitigo. From strep in pitigo, that's about three to six weeks after before they develop GN. Okay, they're going to have the famous lumpy, bumpy appearance on microscopy. There's going to be hematuria because this is nephritic. There's going to be hypertension and there's going to be periorbital edema. Strep pharyngitis is about one to two weeks. So usually the scenario that best describes post-strep GN is going to be following history of an upper respiratory tract infection. Now, eusinophilic, sharply defined, intracytoplasmic inclusion bodies, which are found abundantly in Ammon's horn and the hippocampus okay, of a patient who was bitten by a stray dog. So you know this is rabies. So the question is, what intracytoplasmic inclusion bodies would you encounter in rabies? Guarneri is smallpox. Paul Bunnell bodies are not inclusion bodies. Okay, This is seen in Epstein-Barr virus. Hirano bodies is seen in Alzheimer's disease although Hirano bodies can be seen in Ammon's horn and the hippocampus. Go back to the case. It's the bite of a stray dog. So this is rabies. Correct answer is the negri bodies. So here is the negri bodies, intracytoplasmic inclusion bodies. And please take note that there is also microglia. Okay, Pointed by the blue arrows are the microglia seen in the brain of a patient with rabies. So what do we call these microglia? We call them the babes nodules. Okay, again, we call them the babes nodules. So this is the babes nodules, the glial cells in rabies. So don't forget the stages of rabies, okay? Stage one, two, three, four, and five. Okay, during the acute neurologic period, this is when there's already signs of encephalitis. This is when you can already encounter the negri bodies. During the prodrome, they usually present with hydrophobia. Okay, during the incubation stage, I want everyone to remember uh, the, the initial manifestation of rabies is usually a tingling sensation. Tingling or numbness at the site of the bite. Tingling or numbness at the site of the bite. Then we have a 25-year-old who was admitted in the ICU. So 25-year-old female, ICU, so you know this is critical. Swimming in the Everglades swamp, so this gives you an idea that there's brackish still waters, and the patient 
slipped into a coma after a prodrome of severe headache and sensorial changes. You know this is a rapid form or fulminant form of encephalitis. Your head here is swimming. Okay. Is this cryptococcus? No. Cryptococcus does not cause encephalitis. It causes meningitis. And this is seen in someone with HIV or AIDS. Japanese encephalitis? No, this is associated with a mosquito bite. And this is not associated with swimming. Ebola virus does follow the severity. It can be headaches, sensorial changes, and slip into a coma. But this is a hemorrhagic encephalitis because this is one of your hemorrhagic filiviruses. This is classical PAM or primary amoebic meningoencephalitis, which is caused by Nigleria fowleri. Giveaway, swimming. That is how important your history taking is. So here, let me give you another recall question. This was actually from an actual board. They are giving here a case of a 14-year-old, high-grade fever, headache, vomiting, swimming this time in a lagoon. They now mention motile trophozoites. So you know this is an amoeba. After five days, coma and death. So this is Nigleria fowleri. Okay, so please take note of this. Now here is your rationalization. This is a classic analysis and application question following higher orders of learning by your Bloom's taxonomy. So Nigleria fowleri causes primary amoebic meningoencephalitis associated with warm, iron-rich pools of water. So that is your giveaway there. Now here is a brain of primary meningoencephalitis. So if you notice, it specifically hits the entorhinal and frontal area, frontal cortex, because it enters through the nose and the cribriform plate. And here is your free-living amoeba. Now, the drug of choice for a patient who presented with multinucleated giant cells on Zaxmere. This was from a vesicular lesion. So multinucleated giant cells. First, you have to know that this is herpes. Classic multinucleated giant cells demonstrated from a vesicular lesion. Herpes is not treated with doxy. It's not treated with tetracycline. Doxy and tetracycline, your tetracycline groups, is for the treatment of your rickettsial or arthropod-borne diseases, cholera, and leptospirosis. Your spirochetes as well, particularly doxycycline for chlamydia and your STDs. Gangcyclovir is for CMV. Therefore, correct answer here is acyclovir. Now here, don't forget, multinucleated giant cells is what is going to be revealed when a Zank smear is performed. This is for varicella zoster. This is also for herpes simplex one and two. So this famous reminder, Chan Kevin's, I don't have herpes. So here's your multinucleated giant cell on Zank smear. Now, question. What is the special stain for cryptococcal neoformants or cryptococcus neoformants? So when you have cryptococcal meningitis, this is the famous India ink, wherein what will be utilized is going to be India ink stain. to demonstrate the encapsulated yeast. That is when we test the CSF. Now, the most common segmented virus that exhibits antigenic shift 
and drift. It's not RSV. RSV causes bronchiolitis. It does not exhibit antigenic shift and drift. Rhinovirus, the most common cause of the runny nose or the common cold, okay, followed by adenovirus, that does not exhibit antigenic shift and drift. Parainfluenza, okay, also does not exhibit both antigenic shift and drift. So correct answer here is influenza. So don't forget, difference between drift and shift, it is antigenic shift, which is associated with a major change and it leads to a new subtype. This only occurs in influenza subtype A. It is the antigenic shift, which is associated with pandemics. Antigenic drift, on the other hand, is associated with minor changes within the subtype. And this is associated with point mutations. This is the one associated with epidemics. So this was discussed in class. So don't forget antigenic drift, okay, associated with small mutations, such as point mutations, antigenic shift, major changes now associated with a new subtype. Now, warthin finkeldi bodies are associated with this infection. It's not herpes because herpes are associated with cowdery bodies. Rabies is negri bodies. Moloscum poddangiosum is associated with guarnary bodies. This is seen in measles. So here is a photo of your warthin finkeldi cells. Now, a 25-year-old female Call center agent brought in because of sudden onset of nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. This is after attending an office party, which was specifically four hours ago. So what do you think is the cause of these acute abrupt symptoms? Okay. Is it Vibrio? The answer is no, because Vibrio is profuse voluminous watery diarrhea. Salmonella, the answer is no. E. coli, this is no, because we have ETEC, that's traveler's diarrhea, and we have EHEC, which is enterohemorrhagic. Now, best answer here is Bacillus cereus. Some of you might be looking for staph areas. Yes, that can be possible, most especially if they specify the food such as mayonnaise or custards or salads. What the examiner did here is they removed the specific food associated with these toxins or these bacteria. So instead of saying fried rice, there's the bacillus cereus. So again, it is justified to look for staph areas, but since it is not in your choices, bacillus cereus would be the best answer here because it does have two toxins. Now, which of the following antibiotics is used to prevent traveler's diarrhea? This is, of course, caused by ETEC, enterotoxigenic E. coli, and this is also known as Montezuma's Revenge. So is it cipro, rifaximine, bismuth subsalicylate, or metrodidazole? Correct answer here is rifaximine. This is an RNA polymerase inhibitor. Now, which of the following criteria is not included in the diagnosis of Clostridium difficile infection? CDI is usually going to present with diarrhea in a patient in a hospitalized patient who has received parenteral antibiotics. Number one on the list is clindamycin. After clindamycin are your cephalosporins. So what is not a criteria? Pseudomembranes visualization is a criteria. So take note, this is not included. Detection of the Clostridium difficile uh, toxin that is also a criteria. 
detection of the toxin A and B is also a criteria. What is not included is the more than three unformed stools within 24 hours per day. Because you already have a cause or etiology. Now, which of the following antibacterial agents is regarded as superior in the recurrence of Clostridium difficile infection? Please remember, mild CDI is treated with metro. That is not the answer. Moderate to severe is treated with vanco. This is to check who amongst you read the textbook in Harrison's, read the tables in our handouts rather than some other set of handouts? Correct answer is fidaxomycin. Fidaxomycin. That is the correct answer. Now, the most common symptom in patients with brain abscess, okay, it's going to be headache. Please remember, Brain abscess is usually associated with autogenic infections. So ear infections like otitis. Now, let's just be careful because otitis externa is caused by pseudomonas. Otitis media is caused by strep pneumonia. Autogenic infections would have locations in the temporal lobe. So you're gonna see a temporal lobe abscess. Sinusitis on the other hand, so that's nasal, would have a brain abscess in the location of the frontal lobe. Most common manifestation, it's gonna be headache. Now what stage of brain abscess is characterized by the formation of a capsule? So take note, there's already a formation of the capsule that is better developed on the cortical than on the ventricular side. So the earliest stage, the earliest stage of uh, brain abscess formation is early cerebritis, okay? You know, this is not late capsule, this is early capsule formation. Rim enhancing. Don't forget your differential diagnosis of rim enhancing lesions. So one is toxoplasma, another is TB. Schisto can present with ring or calcifications, so cutaneous solium or neurocysticercosis. So differential diagnosis for ring enhancing or rim enhancing lesions in the brain, toxoplasmosis, tuberculosis or granuloma. We have schistosomiasis and we have neurocysticercosis. Now, 12-year-old girl, ER imbalance, visual disturbances, there's a poor vaccination history, so you're most likely dealing with a childhood illness which is covered or should be covered by the EPI or the expanded program on immunization. There's poor school performance. There's impairment of cognition. There's ataxia and myoclonic jerks. This is very specific. EEG, burst of high voltage, sharp, slow waves. This is very, very SSPE or subacute sclerosing panencephalitis, which is a chronic sequelae of measles, early measles infection. Don't forget anti-NMDA. This is associated with ovarian teratomas. Okay, Paraneoplastic syndrome, ovarian teratomas. This is obviously an encephalitis, not a meningitis which is not part of the classic triad of acute bacterial meningitis, okay? So take note in the classic triad, according to Harrison's, there's fever, there's headache, there's nuchal rigidity. These clinical symptoms, this triad of fever, 
headache and mucal rigidity will be seen in about 80% of individuals. So take note, a decreased level of consciousness occurs in more than 75%. However, it is not part of the triad. Okay. So going back, look at your triad, fever, headache, mucal rigidity. So fever, headache, mucal rigidity. The decreased level of sensorium is not part of the triad. Now, which treatment have been reported to prolong survival? These are all lifted verbatim from the book. Produce clinical improvement. So two premises here, improve survival and clinical improvement in patients with SSPE. Is it isoprenosine and interferon alpha? A cyclovir or both A and B are correct. You have a choice here that says A. So there's a chance that is already correct. Your question now is the interferon alpha included. So this is your rationale. Okay. So both are correct. A and B. Isoprenosine and interferon alpha both improve survival and clinical status in patients with SSPE. So this is lifted from chapter 137 in your textbook. Although there is no definitive therapy for SSPE, treatment with isoprenosine, which is in inociplex, as well as interferon alpha, has been reported to prolong survival and produce clinical improvement. Now, tumor necrosis factor alpha acts synergistically. Uh, this should be alpha. This looks more like a mu, so please bear with this. Acts synergistically with this chemokine. So you know this is a leukotriene, okay? To increase permeability of the blood-brain barrier resulting in induction of vasogenic edema in bacterial meningitis. So please take note. This is interleukin 1 beta. I like to remind everyone 1 beta is B. That's the blood-brain barrier. Beta is the blood-brain barrier. Rationale, both tumor necrosis factor alpha and interleukin B act synergistically to increase permeability of the blood-brain barrier. So that is lifted verbatim from your books. That's why focus and pay attention to our own set of handouts, which gives you the summaries from the books. So here, tumor necrosis factor alpha interleukin beta, they will both induce or increase the permeability of the blood-brain barrier leading to vasogenic edema, and the consequence will be leakage of serum proteins. This will explain why there's a very proteinaceous CSF. In fact, it will give you the spider web coagulum. The most common cause of sporadic encephalitis, is it rabies? No. Is it cytomegalovirus? Mm -hmm. Is it HSV1 or is it HSV2? So sporadic, okay, is herpes simplex virus 1. Cytomegalovirus is the most common cause of acute encephalitis in an immunocompromised host. Again, lifted verbatim from your textbook and discussed during our lessons. The etiologic agent causing PML or progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, this is the JC virus. So don't forget, JC virus is a papovirus. This is the most common cause of progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. It presents with demyelination, okay, motor, 
as well as cognitive deterioration. The most common associated condition with PML is HIV AIDS. Be careful because it is mentioned in our textbook that the drug, okay, the monoclonal antibody, not talizumab, is associated with PML. Okay, it is associated with PML. Okay. So we're going to pause for this subset.